Hey everybody, welcome to Let's Talk Game Design. Uh, this is the Blaster Edition of Let's Talk, where five of the world's best indie game designers get together. We're hosted by uh, Greg Horton, our august uh, graphic designer and marketing expert who's <laughs> part of the Blaster team. And we're gonna talk everything to do with game design. Um, all those topics you want, like to hear about and that five dudes who write tabletop games will talk about when they get together. Things like points or no points, um, alternating activation systems or I go, you go systems. Uh, the, the just the various sort of like uh, I guess controversial topics or topics that come up. How do you become a game designer? What do you use when you write? How do you write? Uh, these are the things that we tend to chat about together, and we thought we'd make a series out of it. So we're doing this live on Facebook uh, for folks to chime in on, and I'll be restreaming this on my uh, YouTube channel as part of Let's Talk going forward. I've been struggling to find a way to do Let's Talk, and this felt like a great way of doing it. Uh, and so I will give you a sort of parental advisory. Anything can happen in these shows. They are live. There might be some language that you don't normally hear on GMG. Uh, so listener and viewer discretion is advised. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the episode of Let's Talk. I am here with Sean Sutter. He is the designer of Relic Blade. Um, as well as co-designer of Mystic Skies and designer of Sludge. And today our topic is going to be concepting a game through to writing a game. Um, so to tell you what we mean before we get started, what we're talking about here is an idea that you've got sort of that germ in the back of your head where you want to have uh, uh, sort of like a creative um, moment. You have an idea for something, you have a concept of, hey, wouldn't it be cool if there's a game that worked like this or that included that? Uh, and then what steps do you take to actually turn that into a functioning something? Um, it's a stage that a lot of people don't get past. You might have a great idea or you might talk about a great idea or, you know, round table with some friends, but never actually get to doing the thing that is making something. Um, and Sean has done this a bunch of times. He's been through that process a bunch of times. And I've been through it twice, almost three times now as I'm writing something new. So um, this we thought would be a good, a good sort of like excuse to talk about an upcoming thing he's got, which is Sludge, and then two uh, current projects he's got, which is Mystic Skies, and of course Relic Blade. So hey, say hi, say hi, Sean, and we'll get this underway. Hi, everybody. I'm stoked to be here talking to you about making stuff. <laughs> <laughs> See, and you make all the stuff too, which I find really impressive. You make, um, I think, except for like, and you've done some of it, except for like laying out the books themselves. You do the art, you sculpt the miniatures. Uh, you've done originally before you got any help, you were doing all the painting for the miniatures, and you wrote the rules and the background for your first game, Relic Blade. So, yeah. walk walk me through that from from the time because you were a comic book artist before this. That's uh, right. Yeah. Uh, you were drawing comic books. What what was the what was that moment where you're like, I want to make a miniature game? Yeah, I mean, it was it was really specific because I uh, I was looking at my like collection of stuff around my art studio, and I had you know I had a bunch of comics on my shelf, but I had way more like Warhammer and War Machine and figures all over, and I, I mean, I just felt like it wasn't possible to make miniatures unless you worked for Games Workshop. And then I, you know, then I started playing War Machine and they're in the US and then they kind of opened my eyes to uh, more games than just Warhammer. And, uh, and then, you know, just playing more and designing more and, and really getting a sense of like the type of game that I'd really want to play. And, uh, and so that was, that was sort of the seed of wanting to do miniatures is like really realizing that there was an indie miniatures uh market or genre world even even. Yeah, yeah world ju just that it existed at all yeah. and then um you know just that it's also really specifically what i love doing i like i love to imagine i love to uh make models i love to do all this stuff so um as an artist it was a really fun opportunity to to do all of the different things of like building a world, doing concept art, doing environment sculpture, doing, uh, you know, lore, writing lore and game mechanics and all of the stuff that I really like. So um, it's not so much about taking a hobby and making it a profession because I already was professionally doing a lot of this stuff it was more like just taking all of the things that i wanted to do and putting it into one business that was my own so i could be my own boss and so i could uh you know make a living doing fun stuff because you know i can i can pay myself if i own if i own my work like i've sold figures i sculpted five years ago today right so that's way different than if i got paid 100 bucks to do a drawing five years ago and 
all I have yeah. is that I didn't. It's it's very different it. to make to make something that you paid for forever versus getting making something for somebody mm-hmm. else and getting paid for it once and then it's yeah. it's gone and you never actually really see it again. Yeah. It's funny. So so Relic Blade uh, when I first encountered it was my, my favorite thing was the tagline under underneath a what was it a adventure battle game i think is what you called the tagline underneath it was relic oh, here hold on my oh, daughter is that's a good crosshair it's okay she's mostly she's mostly hiding yeah. behind the rock play picture we occasionally she, see a floating face hey yeah her uh her online school hasn't started yet for some reason oh weird the teacher's like oh she didn't log into school oops it's my fault. Uh, it's your fault. All right, we're going to pause this. <laughs> <laughs> and there we go. Our break for the realities of 2021 is, <laughs> is online learning resumes. Um, so sorry, I, I think I was in the midst of asking. I'm going to just get us back on topic. Um, yeah. I was talking about, or I, I think I was about to ask about um, the uh, the moment where you have this title, right? I think it's Adventure adventure Battle Game is yeah. the subtitle to Rock Blade. Uh-huh. Um, yeah where how did that form in your head that's what i'm really interested in here is where did the idea of so i've i've grown up with warhammer this like i paint tons of models have this like massive battle throw lots of dice game i played war machine which at the time you discovered it was probably that robot wrestling game that the first edition of war machine was where there was like cool moves and it was very detailed and you know you could hurt someone's arm like there wasn't this sort of like um this like camera is really far back from the battlefield thing it was really dialed in on like the action mm-hmm. and that's kind of exposed the idea that wow you can you can get a really different experience out of playing yeah. a game um and so so where did all of that experiential stuff like pile up in your head to come up with an adventure battle game like where did that yeah, like it, concept come it from? was uh it was really when i i was playing dungeons and dragons when fifth edition first launched and um and i so i'd been playing tons of war machine and then playing D D. and it was a moment of like sitting at the table with my friends playing a cool scenario that i had imagined for everyone to play through and uh and that they were doing these like fun sort of tactical battles with so, some miniatures right right um right. but that like it's been like a half hour between actions. You'd be like, I'm going to swing my ax. And then you roll your D20 and you're like, you rolled a two. Okay. Your ax misses. And then like a half hour again, they're like, Oh, now I'm going to swing my ax. And I hit this time. I do three damage. You're like, okay, good. I don't know. There's, and yeah, it was still fun. Right. Right. That was the thing that like blew my mind is that like, we were having fun. Having a good time. Through these like, through these these like really detailed uh like where technically you can do anything with your actions Mm -hmm. even though mostly you're swinging your sword you can Mm -hmm. do other stuff um and so i wanted to i wanted to take these D &D encounters that happen on a relatively small area with very detailed heroes and monsters and uh and put it into a game so it was like for me relic blade was like a very specific type of game that i wanted to play that didn't exist because i could have it was the dnd encounter as a miniature game (laughs) yeah like so like that moment where where your your dm goes roll for initiative yeah that's what you wanted the experience of sitting down and and playing and it being like uh really the deadly encounter was like the idea because i wanted heroes to be able to get like kicked off of a wall and fall into a pit of lava and like right you know it's it's whatever adventure they went on to try and get to this boss fight in the castle where they're finally going to show down it was cool D D role playing but then you know you get there and and people can get their arm chopped off and then they right. like get thrown into a ditch hit by lightning and you're on, the, yeah. you're on the rooftop fighting across the rooftops and stuff and somebody yeah, hits you with exactly. like a, a weather vane or something yeah and like you you fail your uh agility check to jump across a gap and you're like oh my right. gosh so he plummets their death. So so that sort of stuff I really wanted to bring. And and you know, I love more time, of course. Uh and so I, I wanted there to be like some campaign play, but I I didn't want it to be a game of just troops. I wanted it to really be a heroic scale game where like right. 
you've got a barbarian and a wizard and a it's Tolkien's and, fellowship and right really, you're building really your little fellowship of guys yeah yeah so uh and I think that was part of like as far as concepting uh, as far as like the theme of this conversation I really think uh want wanting a specific experience and wanting a specific game and wanting a specific number of models or t- size of the table or type of terrain or all of those things is really a big part of of like actualizing it all and yeah. and also uh, speaking to hopefully a lot of our audience you know we we've played warhammer we've collected unlimited armies throughout our careers so far and uh and that experience i got growing up of like buying a kit building the kit painting the kit finishing basing the kits you know like painting right. regiments of orcs and like and then playing the games that follow through really is what I do for a living now is like starting Absolutely. with the very beginning, these little seeds. And then like, even if there's a step you don't love, you gotta like do it. Finishing the bases, yeah. you, you do it and you get to the end because the end is like a really cool finished thing. Uh, not to poo poo on anyone that doesn't actually, doesn't paint or doesn't do that <laughs> stuff, but you know, we, the follow through, it's not that the whole thing is, it's every, translatable every skill. Part isn't yeah. our favorite the skill, part the skill translates. Really yeah. It, yeah. There's a definite analogy to finishing projects and finishing mm-hmm. something like this, taking an idea. I mean, that even happens in most miniature war games where your army concept at the beginning, mm-hmm. I'm going to take these troops and I'll paint them a certain way. Following yeah. through to completion is, is really, it, it's the same kind of idea of taking an idea to write a game. I, I can speak to a really similar experience when I wrote last days uh in 2008 2009 probably started um it was the i played it for the first time in 2009 it was because i owned a lot of these um i think made for actually dnd modern uh hassle-free miniatures of these modern day mm-hmm. adventurers and all these zombie miniatures um, and they didn't have a game there was no game there was no this is all before the walking dead this is before project z this is before even zombicide came out from cool Mini or not um, they didn't exist. The only game that was for zombies was that zombies board game where it was just like <laughs> the same glow in the dark plastic zombie a hundred times and like mm-hmm. little survivor tokens going around and fighting. Um, and I could, I, and I love zombie movies since the time I was a kid. I love, it's funny. I, <laughs> I collectively love disaster movies. Mm-hmm. I love movies where you, are trying where you see humanity kind of like assert itself right like whatever it is about that makes us good or bad asserts itself because of some like force majeure or some type of terrible thing happens so i like like the poseidon adventure i like towering inferno i like all the zombie movies I like day of the triffids i like the day the earth stood still war of the worlds like all of those movies to me fall in that same bucket of like something terrible is happening and the zombie movie is probably the most one of the most famous apocalypse movies yeah. and definitely one of my favorite and so again really similar experience to you i've been playing war games most of my life um i didn't have the experience i was looking for you were looking for the D encounter i was looking for the you know the group of, of survivors arriving in what looks like an abandoned town yeah. and and having to either fight for supplies against some other like uh, you know unknown intention survivors or also you know, fight against the zombies that slowly emerge from the buildings and, and, and cause them all kinds of problems. It didn't exist. Yeah. And again, it was about taking the action that was sort of like at 10,000 feet in the games I was playing and really putting a spotlight on one particular thing mm-hmm. um, and trying to bring that to the front. And so writing the game then became, like you said, an exercise in how does what I start making then reflect that experience, that thing that I see in my head. And so I took a very different approach. Obviously, one of the things that I think I, I, I've i always loved about your first your first Rockblade rule book is the illustrations. And a mm-hmm. lot of those illustrations look like they might've even been concepts originally where you've got these like wonderful black and white or just pen line doodles of like pigs chasing somebody or like yeah. you've all of your all of your illustrations for um, the movement phase, like you have the questing guy and he's like jumping a gap or like mm-hmm. all of these great little things that, that feels like it was actually part of the process for you. Can you, yeah, can you tell yeah. me more about that? Yeah. I mean, I think it, it was just also a matter of like being myself. Right. So, so like, uh, and, and, you know, needing a rules example, but then I have a backgrounds in like cartooning and comics and stuff. So it just like really made sense to do that. Uh, right. And then like all the cards and upgrades, right. There's a practical side 
of of wanting to be able to expand the game really easily mm-hmm. right so like having being able to have an expansion be a couple cards is a way different proposition than hope needing another box set or another or another book getting published or laid out or whatever yeah the whole um, card thing saves it's 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 interesting because yeah. it it creates a complexity but also mm-hmm. allows you a whole bunch of freedom doesn't it yeah yeah it's a double-edged sword even though i really hate that saying because as we know that a double-edged sword just cuts really well <laughs> twice it's not right, it right. never is be- good it never hurts bad. you it's always good <laughs> right. but um but the it's really cards are really expensive but they're also really fun so like when now i now i know that a, an actual print run on cards is as expensive or more expensive than doing another hardcover book. So, so like each right. time I print cards, I could have printed another book, but uh, at the time it sounded like it would be better. Uh, anyways, yeah, I think that was part of it. Uh, wanting to feature my illustrations, wanting the game to be able to be expanded pretty uh, freely and, and knowing that uh, I needed to like scale my production to what I could do. And so that was another thing is like thinking about the minimum viable product, where it's like, well, I need like the minimum to play, you'd need this many figures and the minimum to play, you'd need uh, to give people a sense, I'd need these types of things. So, so really starting with the minimum, but over the past five years, Relic Blade's grown so much that like, I've actually filled out a lot of the like things that felt like really, really important, you know? Because at the beginning there were no wizards, right? Right. No, yeah, like, there was a cleric. Really she was about the closest important. you got was the cleric of justice. Yeah. I mean, it's it's a fantasy game. Like Lord of the Rings is like the, the root of it, and one of the main characters is a wizard. <laughs> like the whole reason the story happens is because of a wizard. Anyway, so but I, there were no wizards. So and so it takes a lot of. It took many years for it to like grow into what it is. But that was part of it is like giving myself space to do it incrementally really helped also. When when you were first getting started, how much did like doodling and drawing out that rogues gallery of characters? Cause there's like, there's the iconic characters that stick in my head. The questing that obviously is one of them. Yeah. And he's been one of your favorites forever, actually. That mm-hmm. tired sword on the shoulder. He's kind of plodding along questing night. Yeah, you your cleric of justice. You have your uh, wild elf druid. They're these like these core characters, you know what I mean, in the game. Yeah. How much did getting those drawn out and then the, the antagonists as well, like the barbarian pigs, who mm-hmm. are kind of your orcs, you know what I mean? They're yeah. sort of like the orcs of the Relic Blade world. Yeah. How did getting your head kind of around what they looked like and then drawing them out kind of populate that mythology for you? So you knew you it gave you like a touchstone for your for your design process. how that how did that help? Yeah, I I think it was really important because I did want to have that like D and D party feel, and then I also for that initial set wanted it to have a little bit of a RPG versus war game setup where the pigs did play more like an army, An army, yeah, the heroes played more like a, a party of heroes, and so now now there's enough factions that you have all kinds of play styles across all of the different sides, but um. But that was really important. The the pig men I'd been drawing for ages, like really enjoying drawing those pig barbarians since I was a, I can't, I forget where, I, when I first did those drawings, but it was a long time ago. I mean, pig oh. orcs aren't that. No, no, they're, they're a trope for sure. I also yeah. really, you know, I loved Ninja Turtles when I was younger. So I, I bet, Steady and Bebop thing. Yeah. So like, like these animal mutants, right are are more are like battle beasts if you will of, yeah exactly <laughs> beasts, for sure from the planet, yeah, so the planet I think that's part of it is like primal. realizing that i in my fantasy world there are fantasy there are dwarves and elves and stuff but there's mm-hmm. also a lot of animals um like your iguana soldiers, the, the iguana, the iguana guys are really cool. All of the, it's funny. I think almost most, uh, except for the dark, um, I think most of your, your factions have some kind of an animal callback, like the eel sorcerer, the iguana, uh, the iguan, yeah. sorry. Um, who else? Many of the shark warrior. They all kind of have like an animal time, which I think is really cool because it's, it's a way of taking fantasy races and, I can kind of turning them a little bit and doing this like this kind of like yeah, almost it, like a red wall sort of thing instead. Yeah, red wall and or like if if the dark lord Sauron was using 
ooze to make his mm-hmm. minions instead of using whatever the heck yeah. he used to corrupt orcs into so I don't what the heck are orcs anyways like yeah I just like I really like animals and so it's been really fun and I, I love it when I get a chance to like sculpt an animal so uh, that's also been well it gives it, it gives rock with a unique twist too right mm-hmm. where you have these sort of like you have these very relic blade tropes now like there's a yeah. Rockwood it has a look i think because of the monsters not because of the heroes the heroes are very grounded in kind of like traditional fantasy like you said with yeah. D, whereas the monsters are very much relic blade monsters like the shark mm-hmm. warrior and the eel sorcerer are to me like these these amazing exactly relic blade style yeah. bad guys and yeah. i think it's on it's funny because i think that war games very often get personified more by their bad guys than by their good guys mm-hmm. some it's by the good guys like the 40k and the space marine will be intertwined probably forever mm-hmm. but for me like the pig barbarian and relic blade are and are just like they're at the hip now you know what i mean or yeah. um the trollkin and uh and war machine to me like the yeah. trollkin are like this like very war machine yeah you know what i mean like style monster so it's neat how you've kind of you've you've sort of slowly built into that where relic blade has a feel now you know what I yeah mean? it's fun to look back and be like wow i feel like but i feel like the world exists and i like know so much more about it than when i started because yeah it's very it's very fun and i i'm looking forward to someday in the future when i like write a rpg book Mm. And, and then like races of relic blade and i have mm-hmm. you know like a scale thing like in old D D books that have like oh here's a i'll human. stand next Elves to each other shorter and dwarves are and halflings and half works so you're already and using that like, artist thing be too. like here's a pig here's a lizard yeah, <laughs> yeah. it's fun, but it's funny how how that it's funny because that's again to you that's how you take a concept to life is you uh, yeah. you need that visual you need that work yeah. that that's gonna that's gonna take you into that writing and mm-hmm. i think that's a really interesting actually just like even catch there on you is that you're really excited to write an rpg but mostly because the concept that because you get to stick I get in that RPG, you get to draw this thing exactly <laughs> and harnessing that i think is important i think that's a really yeah. key thing like like what you said when you were when you had this image in your head of what the game was going to feel like to play it does show through in your writing because one of the things I'll, I'll say about relic blade that's different so for instance in um war machine you can't jump right you can kind of climb a wall you know, in 40k, you can kind of climb a wall, but you just you just move horizontally along a surface. You just yeah. you walk on walls the same way you walk on the ground. There isn't anything special about climbing or jumping, right? Jumping a gap or climbing. And so so that just having that detail in there, having that mechanically in there now takes you from a game of mass combat, a war game, to a mm-hmm. adventure battle game, right? Where yeah. you have that those words mean something now. This is a adventure battle game. You jump in adventures, you climb things yeah. in adventures. You might pick up and throw something in an adventure. And that idea that there are actions that you do that are different when the detail is this dialed in versus the abstraction of yeah. where you just measure along the wall and you go up the wall. Yeah. Another thing I, I like is, is sorry, the way I, it connects to the, um, the RPG methodology where it's not, it's not as complicated as, as some games can be like, um, like one thing that makes me think of is I always want in War Machine, I always wanted my War Jacks and War Beasts to like grapple or throw, but I could never remember the rules. And so anytime right. I was like, I think it's time to throw a guy, I'd have to get out my rule book. <laughs> and I mean, that was just like, it was like a gap in my ability to remember right. those rules. But but with Relic Blade, I, I tried to make it as straightforward as possible where it's like you have things every time you do an action it's with a die and if it's has if it's hard to do there's a difficulty and you roll that die like you know and And if a guy's good at throwing a boulder it will be on his card that he has the throw boulder ability and it'll be this die to do it so like it's it's right there it's presented in front of you and it's an option to do those things that are still cinematic right you still imagine them happening yeah you so you've got a lot of control but you it's hopefully avoiding like having to flip through the book and be like how do i grapple like what happens when i lay down like so it's not well, that's very funny because I mean that is a Dean, that is an RPG thing. Having your character sheet in front of you with 90% of the modifiers and rules you need versus having to open the book <laughs> during the game is a very uh, it's the, the cards actually do accomplish that. And so uh, having your character sheet, your card for your mm-hmm. character in front of you is from a concept of hey, I want this to feel like an RP, I feel I want this to feel like a DD encounter. You've got these little mini, mini character sheets and all the information yeah. for what your character can do is in front of you. Yeah, that the was table. the idea was to have 
a character sheet that was that big right and then and then when you upgrade your character when you you gain new skills you just have like another they just lie underneath that's right yeah yeah exactly yeah and you're just you're adding a slight a slight amount of information a new box with information basically underneath them um that and that's to me that's a like again here's the concept here's all the steps along the way and we could probably talk for hours about different ways that i think that rock blade accomplishes that, (laughs) that mission but but i think for our viewers and our listeners that's that's the important thing is you, you need to add elements. You take what you know. So you take like yeah. the, the war game things of like, well, you measure something to move it around or be, yeah. you use dice to resolve encounters, all that stuff. But then when you're checking, is this is is this going to feel like what I want it to feel like from mm-hmm. that very first moment where I came up with this idea of I wanted to do things? Yeah, actually, That's when I wrote, wrote going back and started, looking at it, Sorry. I started with a thesis statement when I started with Relic Blade. Really? Yeah. Um, in fact, actually... I think it's right here. Oh, impress me. Oh. Yeah, see, check it out. Relic <laughs> okay, notes? Oh, look yeah, at that. And, uh, we talked about notebooks too, didn't we? Mike, we on the episode of Mike actually talked about having notebooks. Oh, this isn't the original. This one started right. with one of the expansions, but still like, yeah, I sat down and I was like, thesis statement. And so that, so that as I was developing rules, as I was developing characters and scenarios or anything that I could go back and measure it against that. Yeah. to make sure everything was staying in line with the core principles of Relic Blade. And so that was like, yeah, that was a big part of it. So for me, uh, for me, that's easy, most it's useful. It's easy to like go too far. Yes, absolutely. And for me, that's most useful. And the thing that actually Mike and I talked about in the Billion Sons episode, uh-huh. which is the editing process is, is that I, I write a ton and, and the original version of Last Days doesn't look anything like the current version of Last Days because the 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 question I ask myself is how does this feel like a zombie movie that you're playing at a zombie right, movie and yeah. all the things that people have to do in a zombie movie or a survival movie how how does this accomplish this and if it doesn't do anything to add to it then why is it in here yeah. and like I completely rewrote for instance the group generation systems based on that because having army lists in a game that's supposed to feel like a ragtag group of plucky survivors that have come together made yeah. no sense it was completely right. counterintuitive and so. For me, that 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 goal, having that concept of, I want to create this like disaster movie, survival movie experience in a miniature game. When it came time to look at what I made the first time around, when I held it up against that, I went like, wait, there's a there's an army list for cops, there's an army list for the military, there's an army list for the road gangs. That's not that's not how any of these movies portray these survivor groups. The survivor groups are always different people coming into conflict with each other because of this like force majeure that's it should be people it should just the army should just be a huge group of people and you pick who the leader is and then you pick whoever he found and then even later on i came up with an expansion called chaos theory that people actually really liked which was where you randomly generate your group and you're just stuck with whoever you're stuck with yeah. and they just turn up with whatever they were carrying when they turn off and you you yeah, kind of do I the like, like that idea you hit you hit the like you hit the like the blender button basically and show and like whatever miniatures and i actually did a thing where I, I, I did, I rolled on the charts and I made the miniatures afterwards. And that was very like, yeah, I watched that. I remember that. Yeah. It was a rogue tradery thing where I was like, I'm going to roll on the D 1000 chart to see what my space Marine commanders are with. Like it, it threw me back to that. And I felt like that was a really, that was a really good example of, you know, how useful it is basically to have that kind of like clarity on what your concept is and as you're going through the writing concept. Theme because like you, it, it, it's fine for, you know, like let's use Frostgrave as an example. It would be fine for your wizard to show up at a camp and be like, these are the hobos that are go with you. But it also like, I mean, your wizard isn't like flying by the seat of their pants. They, they planned stuff. Like they made sure they had enough snacks and everything packed yeah. up. <laughs> he went to wizard school. He must have had some planning. You know? He so, like, wizard's college. <laughs> like it, it reinforces theme though in the zombies because like, yeah, you don't choose. And like sometimes the best fighter is also a creep. Like That's right. Yeah. Is a yeah. total jerk. Yeah. Or sometimes the totally useless guy is also a creep. <laughs> and, yeah, exactly. Oh, and, my, and also people and people can develop into heroes too. And yeah. so yeah. later, even adding more rules were like, people can change over time and you can influence either they become better or they become worse taking all that stuff from how does this feel like a zombie movie and watching people change in a zombie movie or become their best selves or become terrible people like however that was going to happen it that that core concept needed to be reflected in the rules of the game and so you find yourself it, it, you know doing that thing where you're mechanically writing things and, and to me again that's that's a big part of why and you said this earlier 
the core engine of a game doesn't need to be complicated yeah. because the more stuff that you can hang on it, like the more, the stronger and simpler it is typically, the more things you can hang on it later on without it collapsing, <laughs> right? It doesn't yeah, need to I mean, be a when, huge. When we were younger, we, we learned that RPGs existed. Right. And before any of us were old enough to buy one, uh, you know, like my, my brother's nine years older than me. So he had books, but I right. wasn't allowed to read them or, or anything. But we knew like, oh, if you do a thing, you roll the die and see if it works. And if it's right. a hard thing, you have to roll higher. It was like, oh my gosh, that's it. That's it. We're done. We're, we're playing games. Yay. From now on, we're playing games. <laughs> and my son even, my son even gets that. Like he bought, um, or I bought him the recruit edition uh, of the Warmer 40k starter set. And it has some basic like stat line things where it just says like two plus three plus four plus five plus. He understands now that just means roll a high number of dice he has this little handful of d6s and he gets like and he just makes up his own games now he puts his guys down and tells me stories and rolls dice and sees what happens but like as a concept it doesn't need to be complicated uh, to resolve something in order to then later add on to it and, and and sort of like support your theme and i think what i'm trying to say here is your core mechanics unless the theme and concept you're going for is very much about the resolution of that thing. So for instance, if you and I are going to make a game about sword fighting and nothing but sword fighting, then the core mechanics should be complicated when it comes to fighting with a sword, yeah. but they don't need to be complicated when it comes to walking down the street. You know what I mean? And so, and so if it doesn't further your theme, you know, don't spend a lot of time on your core mechanic. It, it doesn't need to be complicated. It needs to let you get to doing the next, the, the most important thing people should be focusing on, especially if that relates back to whatever the core concept of the game is. Yeah, with, with Sludge, I really wanted to lean into a horror genre. And I, I think it's, it's pulled back a bit because like I love horror movies, I love horror stuff, but I'm also like not that great at actually when it comes down to it, not that great at drawing stuff that's like upsetting to look at. Not really. No, you're very, I mean, uh, but, I bet uh, you could, but it'd be I, what they're doing. But I'd be like, oh, I, I like it. I like consuming that stuff, but I don't know if I really want to make it. How dark my soul <laughs> is. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, so with, with Sludge, I, I really wanted to make sure that there were game mechanics for gore. And so mm. gore ended up being like this, the way psychology works on the battlefield is that everyone is affected by an overall like state of chaos. Right, that, that, how unsettling the battlefield is becoming as people are like dying around them and things are like yeah, bodies so, just like, piling up and it's just this disgusting like morass. The overall like violence of the event of this battle affects everyone negatively it like mm -hmm. increases disorder in, among your troops and then like if they're if people are being more organized then it's then it lowers again so it's like that threat level of like chaos goes up and down and i um, i try to describe it a little bit in the rules but it's like that as if the battle there are three three forces there's one commander a commander b and then the god of 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 fear and panic right and so and he's just enjoying both you know, phobos and demos are just like laughing because <laughs> they wanted people to be fighting they're getting fed yeah exactly they're getting what they want so but w working through the mechanics of like how i wanted to represent it on the table like i needed it to be easy even though there was detail i wanted it there like people don't want to be bogged down with the psychology phase mm -hmm. but i want so but there's a state in sludge where like you're on round three or round four, games coming close to an end, and you look at the table, and there is gore everywhere. Yeah. There are like <laughs> tokens of like uh, modeled one inch tokens of dead bodies and yeah. blood stains all over. And you can see, oh, yeah, there was a big battle of the there. trail, the trail of gore, of, basically. Yeah. Smear of where troops used to be. And yeah. like, and then you have this moment where you're like, that was this is awesome this is what i wanted this is the battle scene mm -hmm. how many gore tokens if, if you're playing a 500 point game how many gore tokens or so it's is it 400 points or 500 points is uh uh i i recommend that people start with at like 300 300 points okay 150 to 300 but uh i played a 500 point game recently and like i needed more gore tokens than i had yeah now. 
Yeah. But yeah, I think I'll, I'll, I'll produce sheets so you can just right. like print them up. Print and play. Uh, but like modeling them is also really easy because you just sell some, sell some SDLs. That's what you should do. Make it, make an SDL you can buy online yeah, like of like random car token. Well, no, cause then they could be themed. You know what I mean? Like you could do some like roots sticking out of the ground and like oh, cool, yeah. like SDLs of car tokens, but people probably love that. So like the way theme and making sure to like pare it down and make mm-hmm. sure that it's reinforcing the concepts of fun and and also the spectacle of the game on the table uh, rather than just being like a, a mechanics thing. Because I've, I've, there were iterations where it was like, you'd have like a counter on a unit and it'd be keeping track of how much stress they have. And yeah. oh, you don't need that. They're just, if they're standing near a pile of dead bodies, they're stressed there. That's right, yeah. <laughs> and like, you kind of get- <laughs> Things are <laughs> things are getting real. It doesn't matter where those bodies came from. There's bodies everywhere. People to not be stressed. You remove the dead bodies. It's not that they're like scooping dead bodies away. Mm-hmm. It's that they're not stressed about it. You know. Did you ever see the movie? Did you ever see the movie Fury? You ever see the movie Fury? Uh, no, there's it's a, it's sort of on my like. Uh, there's a there's a dinner scene where the tank crew are having dinner. They've like stopped in this village for the night. They're having dinner. And three of them have been like drinking, and the other two are like trying to have this almost like civilized dinner with these two like villagers. Uh-huh. And they come busting in the three that have been drinking and they're like upset that they weren't invited to this dinner and like mad. And they start telling stories basically about like how awful the time they've had basically in this war has been. And one of them is after the beach landings in Normandy talking about how they had to spend three days basically putting down all of the like local horses and that there was just miles of bodies basically. They like, they like, they like captured some German army and like, and they just wiped them out. They like, caught them in a crossfire and like wiped them out. Uh-huh. And just how psychologically damaging it was to just see that much death and destruction going yeah. in every direction. You know what I mean? And it's this, I, I, I immediately thought of that when you're describing that level of stress of just like the one guy says, the eye sees it, but the brain can't understand it. Can't understand how that can be a real thing. You know what I mean? And, and that's, I, I, that, it evoked horror just hearing it described, like not even seeing it, but just hearing it described. And so yeah. I love the idea that that's, that's going to play out eventually in the game. You know what I mean? Yeah. Is that you're going to have that. Yeah, and like, like you can have a unit crush and like you have, you've got like a really strong elite unit and these guys that weren't ready and they're already weakened and you come in like just destroy them and you mm-hmm. don't suffer any casualties. Mm-hmm. But then in the end round, your guys start getting stressed and you'd be like, well, why wouldn't they be stressed? Because of all of the violence that they just committed. It's like. Because <laughs> yeah, of all things <laughs> they literally just did. Stressed. Yeah. <laughs> it's i don't think it gets any easier you know yeah. I mean? like all of that stuff gets harder and more insane and then yeah. in your world too you've got this you've got this in, insane sort of like premise too where you can't die where all this yeah. is happening yeah, over like, and over again and people just bind their wounds with this like world yeah like people, and slowly become more degenerate basically choose that. Yeah. yeah yeah and so they become these like degenerate monsters that that have just chosen to stay alive by packing their wounds with this like ultimate igdrasil world tree that they're like shoving into their bodies and slowly yeah. corrupting them yeah that's exactly. awesome yeah i love I, that it's a war game about the horrors of war thing. <laughs> like i uh i like i like the metaphor of violence and i like the metaphor of warfare but i like really despise it <laughs> right <laughs> so, yeah, yeah uh and so wanting to play with historical figures because there's so many great kits is like i want to play with those but i really do not want to play real conflict history yeah yeah and so like i think that's another thing that sludge offers is like it's reinforced like not only is violence like uh not good for anyone in this battlefield situation but it's also not real like there's like their their nations imaginary nations right caught in a cycle of vengeance that's a metaphor for our own corruption of violence but also in a fun way where you get a command cavalry and infantry and cannons stomping and, around yeah, and, stuff. Stuff and exploding yeah, double soldiers like, wow this is quite a spectacle this is sort of neat and tactical and uh mm-hmm. and cool scenarios and like a horror setting and you get a kind of hopefully it's it's the first game i wrote where i was like really trying to think about the themes and think about like i want someone to play this and think oh yeah violence is shitty yeah <laughs> uh, and and then also play it and be like this is fun and i get it like i get the metaphor for for struggle 
I get the metaphor for the futility of violence and the cycle. Well, the rules, the rules force, force almost an appreciation of what your troops are going through. Right. Cause like you can't avoid the fact that, that you might've just won that fight, but your guys are still freaking out because of what they just, they just went through. And the, the, the table is piling up with like the, the results of this conflict or whatever. And that if, and if you remove, I mean, like, yeah, there's also like this, metaphor for like the yeah like unyielding because of um anger and hate mm-hmm. but then also the way the using the arcane to continue their lives just for revenge right and like and like just for to further an endless cycle and then also that that the more they use that resource it's the reason the world is dying right and so yeah, yeah so then there's more metaphors of course about um the cyclical yeah, nature and all, and all that stuff with, yeah. with uh, abusing the earth and so yeah it's it's, it's cool. fun it was really fun to write a game that was the type of battle game i wanted to play using the type of figures i wanted to play in a context that i want to explore with the themes i want to explore you know and so enjoying it as a writer enjoying it as an artist and enjoying it as a hobbyist has been really how, how did it feel to not have to make the miniatures this time though yeah, is that stoked. liberating? Although, I mean, I just a big part of it for me is that if I had time to, I would be sculpting these models. So, like, I think part of it is I want people to be able to use the the absolutely insanely cool Perry miniatures plastic kits. I think those those models are just bananas. I, I'm really, really a big fan. And so con- um, converting those kits has, is really fun. And I've been looking, I've been like scouring for a reason to use them for, for a long time, but like, I'm not that interested in the rule sets for Napoleonics that I've, I've read so far. And I haven't, I haven't explored a ton. Um, and then, you know, ACW, like I really despise the American Civil War. Right. Um, but like some of those kits are so cool. <laughs> so if i can have well it's all fantasy anyway too unless, unless you're making a diorama every game about that is a fantasy everything that would happen unless you're unless you're stitching the names of the soldiers on that stuff it's all made up it's all fictional yeah. reenactment like none of it's real so like why not yeah. just make your own game yeah you exactly. get to enjoy those and model like, kits and and do it in a way that is not tied to any of the you know grossness that can be history yeah and it's sort of it's fun to have these like guys from napoleonic era with like these beautiful uniforms going up against these like impetuous guys in sack coats that are just like covered in mud and they're like we don't use fancy hats but we kill like, I don't know. Right, yeah. like my weapon i got a back covered in barbed wire just so funny yeah. um yeah so it's it's been really really fun um but then there's like more deeper into like the the world of sludge like the the stuff that's more unique art wise um i'm looking forward to getting the time to sculpt some of those figures and like and release kits for the game uh but it's nice to know like there's a scale that i can fall back on that has like a ton of really great kits there's Mm -hmm. and so if i make things to like line it line up then hopefully you can use if i get to sculpt the things that I want to sculpt um, or commission sculptures of the things that I want, uh, that those kits will still fight against the- Yeah, it'll be the same scale. You can even make cool things like accessories, like heads, you know what I mean? So you can use your collection of plastics and have like- Yeah, yeah, I have- Sludge specific accessories. Sludge heads that are in production now. Cool, Uh, awesome. And and we'll be offering those through Black Sight Studio. So I don't have to like, so I can be a little bit more hands off than I- Yeah, you can be at a a step away basically. I can all have more help with fulfillment so it doesn't like um, wearing too many um, hats. Yeah, absolutely. That I'm not like drowning myself in shipping orders, but I can just- And it's relatively minor anyway. It's not whole kits and stuff like that. So why not just just make your life easier and focus on making a fun game? Yeah, and Sunday. Someday I'd love to make line infantry or special cavalry units. Mm Because like I did art with um, guys riding like fantasy llama creatures. Right. Uh, and then also like bird rider cavalry, like chocobos. Mm-hmm. Um, and so there's stuff I'd like to do. Right now it's very low fantasy setting, right. but it'd be pretty cool if there were dragons and demons. You're you know? in like Sharps Rifles, Age of Rifling kind of stuff, turn of the century, level warfare, yeah. basically in sludge. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, cr- Crimean 
yeah. war, American Civil War ACW, level of yeah. technology. Yeah, but but pre mechanized, so that you don't have things that make war unfun like machine guns. You still gotta like walk around and stand together and load the things and act. Like maybe the maybe the hand crank Gatler will show up yeah, someday. Maybe, That'll be it. No, no gas power, no gas power automatic weapons. Yeah. But an armored train, hell yeah. That'd be pretty cool. Armored yeah, train, when yeah. you deploy the armored train, you have first you have to lay the tracks and they can only go okay. there. <laughs> I want my I want my Doc Artemis spider walker. That's what I want. I want my Artemis Clyde Frog. Give me some Wild Wild West. Some Wild Wild West. That'd be awesome. That'd be great. So, but well, yeah, cool. I, I feel like there's just so much I can do with that. And, and then same with what I did with Relic Blade, where the core set was like a minimum viable product. Right. I think with Blaster, I get a print print this this the core rules, and then with Blaster, I'll also be able to explore new maybe new settings, new types of units, new campaigns, and yeah. you know, all the things that you'd find in an old fashioned like thick Warhammer rule book, where you're like, what? Yeah. They've got rules for kill team. You know, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. where you, like, you add a layer, add a layer, add a layer. Yeah, you can do, you can break it down to skirmish where it's like model and model, there's all kinds of things you can do. Yeah, I and think it's what's a matter of like following the inspiration and having fun. Well, it's interesting because what we're talking about here is you're talking about a game where right now you've, you've got a game that you're so far past the concept stage of that it's become its own living, breathing world. And that's where Rock Blade is uh -huh. to sludge where you've just got the concept like, mm -hmm crystallized you know what i mean yep. you know what it can be mm -hmm. but you still have all this room and all this time and all this potentiality yep. to make it into what you eventually want it to really be so you've yeah, captured it's that fun. idea it's, and your the future's kind of like really open a lot of the a lot of the hobby time like my own growth of like my own hobby and like what mm -hmm. i wanted to build what tables i wanted to build what armies i wanted to build really is reflected in sludge a lot um, but at this point where I'm at, like, yeah, writing a rule book is part of my hobby. Like, you know, I'm, I'm becoming more and more of a grognard where like, yeah, of course I have my own rules for Napoleonic <laughs> like, you know, Well, there wasn't a game, so I wrote one. I mean, I think that that's, that's just, that's that, that's that push that some people listening might need is there was, I wanted a game. It didn't exist the way I yeah. perceived it. And so I just made one. And I think that's a real, like. That's a real, I think, like lesson there is that when you have a concept, you have an idea for a game, the only thing stopping you from bringing that to life is the work between point A and point B. Yeah. And so when we talk about that life cycle, yeah, it's work, but it's like finishing an army. You know what I mean? Yeah. You need to do all the parts that you don't enjoy. And that can mean being organized, like taking notes and having a thesis and having like a structure and outline before you get started. And then just breaking that outline into today's work is just this section. I want to finish this section and grinding it out. Yeah. And then the even less fun work of after you've written all that stuff, out, going back and deleting it and making it simpler because it was too much and it was yeah. stupid. It shouldn't be in there. Mm -hmm. Like all of that stuff leads into, Hey, I have a great idea for a game. I want to be a game designer to, Hey, I wrote a game. And even if nobody plays it, you can still play it. You can teach it to your friends. Like I, I think that there may be a, a misnomer that people write miniature games to make them commercially successful and have someone else play them. That's not why you write a miniature game. You write a miniature game because you want to write a miniature game, mm -hmm. period, end statement. And if yeah. you eventually you show it to people and they think it's cool and you decide you want to make that leap into having other people play it, then do that. Otherwise, just play it with your friends. Make okay. make two armies and play it with somebody. Yeah, You've still and, done or, it. Yeah, find figures that like you really like and don't have the game for and answer the question of what what is the game for these you know? exactly like, i think that yeah. matters and it, we're in such a crazy time for that like with patreons of 3d printable models and or like you know tons of d d and d miniatures that people yeah. produce and it's like they're just fantasy models and they've got i have no idea what they're for you know? It doesn't matter. Make yeah, it's the right it's game. Totally. <laughs> I mean, and same with like tons of sci-fi stuff. Or yeah, even, there's robots, there's tanks, there's cyberpunk, dude, like, there's everything. There's, there's no need to sit and be complacent about like, well, I love the war cry miniatures, but I don't think I care about the game. It's like, yeah, well, if you love the miniatures and you want to play a game with them, like you can make up a game. But well, ain't nobody got time. Know, not for everyone well. wants to do all that, but it's true. You can you can play with figures. It's gonna be cool. And I'm gonna presuppose that if you're listening to this games. podcast and you have an interest in game design, it's because you think you might want to. Yeah, <laughs> so, of course, it isn't for anybody, and it isn't for everybody, and it's hard work, and a lot of it sucks. Um, because there's gonna be parts you don't like, but at the same time, 
uh it talking ain't doing i guess is the yeah. is the and it's a saying. lot like it's a lot like game mastering mm-hmm. you know and so everyone wants to play a dnd game no one wants to jam work, but... yeah exactly you have to find that part rewarding and and i'll be honest there is something to be said i'm sure you'll agree with this um the first time you see someone else play something on their own with no encouragement and no help from you that you wrote the yep. first time I ever saw somebody build a whole table with a train and a whole bunch of miniatures to play last days uh-huh. was a very, like a very interesting internal moment for me. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? And that definitely encouraged me to do, to do more later on and yeah. gave me like a feeling of responsibility and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that was wild. I remember the first uh, relic blade battle report you put up. I was <laughs> like, Oh, I sure hope that what I wrote made sense. Cause you <laughs> by reading what i whatever the heck i wrote in that little booklet yeah (laughs) it's pretty funny you like kind of have this moment where you're marveling at language you're like wow Mm -hmm. i explained that and you got it and now we're adventuring Mm -hmm. and now he's painting his yes right now the bone mans are jumping on his questing night and beating him up and going after treasures and stuff i mean that's that's i think that's the that's the thing is if if you if you do ever get to that point and you see somebody else appreciate the experience you wanted them to have and create, then that tends to be all the energy and enthusiasm you need to go off and do it again and do the hard I work. I still and- get like, I still get like really amped when I hear people make comments about Relic Blade that makes it so it's really clear to me that they've played it. Mm-hmm. Like when they, when they talk about, no, actually, yeah, the art is cool, but like the way the action mechanics work and like I'm overwhelmed with <laughs> options. Resource management. There's like this comment I can get where people are like, oh yeah, I think it'd be good for kids. And it's like, you haven't played it, right? I mean, it's fine for kids, but like mm-hmm. it's a very tactical game. Like it's in, in depth in how you make decisions. So like there are people that are like, yeah, I think I'd play it with my kids. I'm like, yeah, all right. Do buy the game. Do try it. Do play it. Get your kids involved. That'll be awesome. But then there are other people that when I get really stoked, it's like I can tell when I get a comment from someone and it's like that person has played Relic Blade. Right. Sure. Yeah. That person's that person's put it to the test and stressed yeah. it and done a bunch of stuff with it. Yeah. And so that's I still get like really amped when I hear certain types of comments where that's awesome. You get it. Sweet. Well, there you go. And that's from concept through to delivery. So mm-hmm. I hope you guys enjoy that. Um, I think we have done this topic to death. Uh, and if you have any more questions or ideas for a show, put them in the comments below. Big thanks for watching and listening. Big thanks to Sean for coming on. Yeah, my pleasure. I could, yeah, we'll we'll talk more soon. No, of course, <laughs> we're going to do this again. Uh, we'll probably do it again after Sludge comes out and we get to oh, we get to see what people do with it. That'd be fun. Yeah, uh, if there weren't a virus, I'd fly up there. And we could of course, it. and we'll do some battle reports. Maybe we can do something, maybe we can do something uh, through like Zoom or through like remote playing or something like that. I can try and make technology work so we can do that. Mm-hmm. So anyway, we'll see you next time and you can hear us next time for more Let's Talk. Till then I'm Ash, this is Sean. Have more gaming. Thanks for tuning in and checking out today's Let's Talk Game Design. Now, if you have ideas for topics that uh, me and the Blaster crew could discuss, put them down in the comments below and let us know what you thought about this episode uh, and any of your thoughts on the topics that we talked about. Big thanks for watching. We'll see you next time for the Let's Talk. Till then, I'm Ash. Happy programming.